Titanam Pavanebyo Vaishnavebyo Namaho Namaha. I'd like to at the same time welcome but offer my most humble and grateful obeisances to all the devotees. Uh, thank you all for taking your time to attend this discussion. Uh, we were all supposed to be here in Zagreb. That is actually where I am right now in the Zagreb temple. Uh, I was just looking at the temple this morning and thinking, boy, if it wasn't for the presence, present situation, there would be, you know, hundreds of devotees here. And uh, so I was feeling a little sad because of that. But here's an opportunity anyway, uh, somehow or other by the arrangement of uh, technology, we can still somehow or other make some communication and try to uh, keep uh, the essence of that communication on what we wanted to do in person, and that is to speak about the process of pure devotional service. Um, before I begin the gist of my particular presentation, I just like to just preface everything by saying that um, um, pure devotional service is the natural, spontaneous propensity of the living entity towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As we mentioned, Previously, in other lectures, when that propensity of service is dovetailed toward the Supreme Lord, and when it's free from any personal motivations for gain, in terms of uh, material gain, or even material gain on a subtle level, uh, karma and gyan, then, and when it's uh, uninterrupted, it awakens pure, pure loving service to the Lord. So uh, with that much said, I'll begin my lecture and we'll have time for discussions and questions afterwards if it is needed. I chose to speak a little bit from uh, Rupa Goswami's two verses from Nectar of Instructions. Uh, Srila Rupa Goswami is our Abhideya Acharya. He is empowered to teach the process of pure devotional service. And he was given that empowerment directly by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spent 10 days speaking every day to uh, Srila Rupa Goswami at a place called Allahabad Prayag which is a very, very sacred place. Um, after hearing and imbibing everything that Mahaprabhu said, later on he went and composed many, many written literatures. And the, one, the foremost of that written literature is uh, Bhakti Rasamatu Sindhu, which is Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada has given us a summary form of that called the Nectar of Devotion, which teaches the uh, process of pure devotional service and all the intricacies that is necessary in order to achieve uh, pure devotional service. It is called the Handbook uh, for the Execution of Pure Devotional Service. And it was highly emphasized by Srila Prabhupada in one lecture, he said, read it once, read it twice, read it thrice. You want the devotees to read it and to study it and to understand how to apply it. He also, Rupa Goswami also wrote one other shorter version of the process of pure devotional service, which is called Nectar of Instructions. Uh, when that book was released, Srila Prabhupada became so, what we say, visibly joyful. He really was happy to see it in print. And he said, distribute this book everywhere. And it's only 11 verses. And uh, we'll be speaking uh, from the second verse and the third verse. 
Um, there was some a little uh, misunderstanding that I would speak favorably of the six principles and then unfavorably tomorrow. But in devotional circle, circles, you always end with something favorable, not something unfavorable. <laughs> so you always present what is not, and then you present what is in order for it to have the proper flow and the proper conclusion. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So uh, Rupa Goswami, in the second verse, he mentions six things that are considered to be blocks or what he calls entangle one in materialistic activities and they spoil, he uses that word, spoil one's devotional service. The first one he calls atyahara, eating more than necessary or collecting more funds than required. Prayasa, over endeavoring for mundane things that are very difficult to obtain. Prajalpa, the word prajalpa comes from the word prajana, which means to talk. But then there is qualification, or not qualifications, categories of speech and speech must be regulated in such a way that it is not in the category of unnecessary. So unnecessary speech means talking about things unrelated to spiritual matters. Number four is called Niyamagraha, just practicing rules and regulations for the sake of practicing. In other words, I know the rules, I know the regulations, I practice them. If someone asks me why, I say because I was told this is what I must do. In other words, not knowing the reason behind and what is the benefit that one uh, gets from practicing these uh, rules, vidis, nishedas, regulations like that, uh, things to do and things to avoid. <clears throat> and the second half of the same word, and it's also emphasized a little different in the spelling, is that uh, uh, rejecting rules and regulations and simply acting according to one's uh, attitude. In other words, um, what we say, whimsically, not, know, uh, not doing what is told, but adding, detra distracting, detracting uh, from the actual rules and regulations. The third is called Jana Sangha, associating with worldly-minded people who are not interested in Krishna consciousness, and we'll, we'll explain what that means in detail. And Laoyam, being greedy for mundane achievements. Hmm. Um, okay. So uh, I'm getting some signs on the internet that pe persons can't hear. Is it is devotees can hear me out there? Just a little feedback so I know. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, it's then it's from your side if you can hear. Okay, if you can't hear. Okay. So we'll start with Atyahara. This pertains to a human beings, uh, not living entities on the lower scale. Atyahara means uh, accepting sense objects in a spirit of enjoyment. In the first verse of uh, Nectar of Instructions, it mentions that there, uh, one should control the six urges, the urges of the tongue, the urges of the belly, the urges of the genitals, the urges to speak, the urges of the mind, and the urges of uh, speech, I believe. Yeah, speech, mind, and one more. Um, these are what is called conditional. Conditional means under circumstance. Mm -hmm. Verse 2 doesn't speak about conditional in terms of uh, controlling the tongue in terms of overeating or uh, activities in relationship to the tongue, such as also speaking. 
it's mentioned that this is constitutional. Constitutional means it is, it is required in order to reach one's natural constitutional position of uh, engaging in devotional service to the Supreme Lord. The applications for the grihastas and the applications for the renunciates are slightly different. The principles are the same, but in essence, um, Hari Bhakti Vilas is often cited in relationship to this part. And Hari Bhakti Vilas mainly deals with the principles that are required for those in the Grihasta Ashram. So uh, some of the principles are, is that uh, it explains that yeah. Uh, a sober person, of course, we under, we heard the first verse. Everyone is forced to act according, helplessly, according to the modes of nature they require. And no one can do anything, uh, what we say, without, uh, uh, you know, even for a moment. In other words, one cannot be inactive. So... But one should restrain the senses and focus the senses uh, away from sense objects. But then again, where do the senses go? So there is those who try to <clears throat> control the senses by subliminating the senses to inactivity and not thinking about sense objects. But the principle of Atyahara is to divert one's attention away from those sense objects which are uh, geared to materialistic consciousness and dovetail them towards Krishna. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, it's not possible for one to become a yogi if he eats too much, eats too little, sleeps too much or doesn't sleep enough. One has to be temperate and eating. Temperate means the moderate road. Eating, sleeping, working, and recreation. So Krishna gives the formula that although these things must be used in the service of the Lord, also in a temperate way. In other words, it's called the golden mean, not too much, not too little. And that may, dis that may differ from person to person. Uh, so one person would require more than another in that category of both eating and collecting and others less. So we know for the renunciates, it's always on the lesser side. And for those who live in Grihasta life, because there is some responsibility to have material things in order to run one's household. So that collecting is not against the principle of Atyahara. So at the same time, uh, it goes on to ex explain that all of one's senses, when it's used in the service of the Lord, away from the activities just to satisfy the, the what we say, the lusty desires of the mind and senses, such as seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, moving about, sleeping, breathing, all these things are... When it's done in relationship to Krishna, it, uh, it is not against the principles of Atyahara, like that. So, um, uh, now sometimes devotees ask the question, well, if I overeat, does that mean I fall into the category of Atyahara, you know? No, it's not. It, it's, there's a qualitative uh, explanation that needs to be understood. If one perpetually or continuously or is addicted to that process of eating more than required, that is atyahara. Sometimes we see in certain festivals or certain occasions, appearance and disappearance days, uh, appearance days of the Lord, there are big feasts served and one may eat more than required. That is not breaking atyahara. Atyahara means when one becomes uh, accustomed to eating always like that. And collecting too much in the nectar of instructions. I mean, I'm sorry. In Sri Yashupanishad, it says, Isha Vasha Midam Sarvam. 
yat kincha tam tam jagatena jagtena bunjitaha magridaha kasuswidanam that everything owned and everything animate and inanimate is owned and controlled by the Supreme Lord and one should live according to their quota. So we also hear that simple living and uh, what we say, uh, uh, activities in devotional service are supported easily and naturally when one lives towards, one lives according to their needs. So not too much, not too little when it comes to material things like that. So this one, I think devotees don't struggle with this first one so much, Atyahara. Although it might be there for a few of, a few of us. Uh, the purport is that one has to control the urges of the senses by through the process of regulation. As Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, that when the senses and mind are regulated, or, or when the senses are regulated, then lust is uh, somewhat subdued, and then one can uh, develop higher knowledge like that. So the application is different for different uh, persons. So the idea of the principle uh, Rupa Goswami mentions in Nectar of Devotion, in uh, one verse he says, and this is the key verse where Prabhupada always said, when one is not attached to anything, but at the same time accepts everything in relationship to Krishna, one is rightly situated above possessiveness. And then we have the contrary, one who, on the other hand, rejects everything without knowledge of its relationship to the Lord is not as complete in renunciation. Yeah, so we see that people give up things because they're troublesome. But that's not necessary renunciation. Renunciation actually is a consciousness where every, every the person sees everything in relationship to Krishna and uses everything in relationship with Krishna and takes what they need in order to keep body and soul together. So that's a little bit about Atyahara, prayasa, over endeavoring, over endeavoring for mundane things, useless labor. Spiritual life is natural. It is not defined by any kind of arrangements, material arrangements. Um, prayasa means to uh, somehow rather accumulate unnecessary things, both in the material sense and in the, what we say, philosophical sense. There's two kinds of prayasa, jnana prayasa and karma prayasa. Okay. One verse that's, which is illustrated by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur in that relation, he says, the Supreme Lord is not obtained by expert explanations, by vast intelligence, or even by much hearing. He is attained only by whom he chooses. To such a person, he manifests his own form. So devotion to the Lord is the only way to obtain the Lord not all these things that we may perform in the activities of devotional service. It is devotional ser devotion to the Lord, which attracts the Lord and situates one on the path towards, uh, towards, the, towards the Lord. So uh, Lord Brahma, of course, he speaks many verses in relationship to this. He also says, you know, devotional service is the only auspicious path. If one gives it up and simply engages in speculative knowledge, uh, trying to understand the nature of the material world or what is the nature of the conditioned soul in the material world, he undergoes a great deal of trouble. And he goes on to explain it's just like beating an empty husk of rice, one is fruitlessly uh, performing activities. So uh, prayasa simply means to 
accumulate either material or philosophical things that are not necessary for one's, what we say, practice of devotional service. Uh, but there is some, just like if you need to go out on Sankirtan, obviously you need some books. So you have to procure books in order to do the service. That wouldn't be prayasa. A grihasta has to maintain their household. So some, some endeavor in order to accumulate, or not accumulate, acquire certain material things in order to, man, to maintain the household properly so one can focus their consciousness on devotional service like that. And of course, uh, there's those who seek liberation. Uh, Prabhupada used to say devotional service is always already on the platform of liberation. Those who want to seek liberation separately and perform very, very strict austerities and penances in order to detach themselves away from the desire to enjoy the material energy. Uh, but they undergo a useless struggle. Better to simply engage under the spiritual master's guidance, the activities of devotional service. So these first two principles, Atyahara and Priyasa, are somewhat overlapping. And basically what the essence is that anything done for one's material gain is simply takes one away from the pro platform of devotional service and becomes an obstacle in making advancement in devotional service. So one has to learn the art of using everything in the service of the Lord, and at the same time learning the art to take what is necessary in order to keep one's body and mind and practice of devotional service stable. Mm. So sometimes we find devotees struggle with that a lot. How much do I take? You know, what's too much? What's too little? Well, that, that can be understood simply by the, the practice of devotional service. One has to be honest to understand what you need and what you don't need. And of course, if one slips in these categories, one should be, one should be diligent to correct it. Now, one of the things that happens in devotional service is called this is mentioned by uh, um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, Taranga Rangini. Taranga Rangini means seeing the perks or the benefits of devotional service as indications of one's advancement in spiritual life. In other words, if one has a particular position within the society, or if one is in an has certain, in other words, if one is a spiritual master and I have some followers, well, I have many followers, therefore that indicates I'm advanced. Well, I'm, people are giving me wealth. I'm, you know, money is coming. Uh, eulogies are coming. Uh, material benefits are coming. If one simply sees these things as indications that they are making advancement in devotional service, then these can cause one to fall down. And one can become slack in the actual process of purifying the heart, which comes by hearing and chanting the holy names of the Lord. And hearing and chanting the transcendental name, form, fame, pastimes, qualities of the Supreme Lord. These are where advancement is made. Now, in devotional service, one of the things that is one that would be maybe presented by the material energy as one makes advancement is one the desire for fame. Uh, Rupa Goswami also mentions this. Oh no, actually, Sanatana Goswami. I'm sorry. In his Hari Bhakti Vilas, he says, even if one can give up all material desires, the desire for fame is very, very difficult to give up. This desire for fame is compared to stool, which is the root cause of all anarchists. Therefore, one should carefully avoid touching this stool-like desire for fame. So, um, yeah. So how do we deal with that? As you make advancement in devotional service, we find even the Supreme Personality of Godhead 
likes to glorify his devotees. And some in that glorification, the Lord some provides an opportunity for one to um, be in a position to accept, you know, to accept service, or even to accept uh, when we say eulogies you know, or whatever. In other words, one may find themselves, you know, uh, the reciprocant of things that are due to one's devotional service. Uh, and one starts to, when we say, become important or feel important. Like sometimes we see, even in our, you know, our kirtan groups, you know, we have our outstanding kirtan leaders, and that's wonderful, and that we want that. But sometimes, you know, there's a little bit of a goopy thing that comes around that. And this is, and one becomes famous as a kirtan leader, one becomes famous as a person who can speak so nicely on certain things. And if one takes that and, you, and accepts that and in the material sense, in other words, one is feeling not so much happy by what they're giving, but what they're getting in devotional service, then that is a cause of fall down. And that is one of the anarchists, as mentioned by Srila Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, in his uh, Bhajana Rahasya, the desire for fame, because that, you know, uh, the, the ultimate principle of material, uh, what we say, uh, an art. In other words, there's, it, it's easy to get rid of, not easy, but when one makes advancement in devotional service, that one is the toughest one to, to throw off. <laughs> That can stay. That can go all the way up to one's, uh, uh, what we say, uh, even level of prema. And we have the example of one. Uh, I think his name was uh, Rupa Kaviraj. He was a great orator on Srimad Bhagavatam, and he would hold public meetings, and many people would come. And he became famous for speaking. We even see that in the material world now, we find people are expert at reciting verses or narrating the whole Ramayan or speaking the whole, uh, you know, Bhagavad Gita by heart. Well, this Rupa Kaviraj was attended by one of, in one of his meetings by uh, Krishna Priya. Now, Krishna Priya was a great devotee of the Lord and she couldn't stop chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. She was addicted to chanting. So she came to attend his, uh, to his lecture. And uh, she was also chanting very softly to herself while she was listening to the lecture. Uh, Rupa Kaviraj became a little bit disturbed, thinking that, wow, why isn't she listening to my lecture? She's chanting. So he made that a public display and started to criticize her. She remained quiet and didn't respond to his, his uh, accusations. And, uh, but later on, because he offended her, he fell down. So what was the cause of the offense? Well, he was thinking he was so important that, uh, you know, if someone doesn't listen to my lecture, or someone apparently is not listening. She was listening, but he was thinking otherwise, and he was becoming disturbed. So he had developed this false pride, which came by way of being somewhat famous for a, for a lecture on the, on the scriptures. So these subtle things can happen even to great persons who make great advancement on the path of devotional service. So this prayasa. Um, simply, as Bhakti Vinoda Kaur says, one should be eager to give, a, give it up. When a devotee humbly and without duplicity chants and remembers the holy name, then real intelligence awakens. So the practitioner attains perfection and all these endeavors for yoga positions, karma, jnana, mukti, all these things, all these endeavors for all these other things fall away 
when one humbly engages in devotional service. So we have that. Yeah. Hare Krishna course, Maharaj, your yeah. microphone has moved slightly. Can I just can hear you clearly? Yeah. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Perfect. Okay. So there's one verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam spoken by uh, Lord Brahma. He said, my Lord, even if one is favored by a slight trace of the mercy of your lotus feet, he can understand the greatness of your personality. But those who speculate to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead are unable to know you, even though they continue to study the Vedas for many years. So the purport would be that we want to gain the favor of the Lord by pleasing the Lord in devotional service. And that doesn't require any extra endeavor. The Lord is pleased, as he says in Bhagavad Gita, Patram Pushram Falam Toyam Yomi Bhakta Panashiti Taraham Bhakta Uparitam Asnami Payatat Manaha. That... Uh, Simply by whatever you offer me, if you offer me with devotion, then I am pleased. And when the Lord is pleased, that is devotional service. Okay, I will speak a little bit about the third one, idle talking, prajalpa. Uh, it's not possible to stop talking. <laughs> of course, there are some yogis who uh, take vows of silence, but we find that that is artificial. Prabhupada said, I, I can speak forever, but I'll speak on the, on the glories of the Supreme Personality of God in devotional service. To remain, remain silent is no better than the trees or the stones in nature. So when nothing is glorious about remaining silent, uh, Therefore, one has to learn the path of uh, proper speech, and there are different ways that one should, uh, what we say, present speech. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, one should speak truthfully, pleasingly, avoid speech that offends, and one should regularly recite uh, scriptures in order to back up what one says. Now, this prajapa is more or less talking about what is averse to uh, devotional service. And uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur makes a listing of different types of prajapa. Mm -hmm. And uh, these. And he mentions that there are about seven or eight different kinds of useless talks like that. Um, let me see, give me a minute here and I'll find the list. Okay. Uh, okay. Hey, godless prajapas are impediments to devotional service. I think I would like to preface what I'm going to say that this one is the one that we have to be very, very conscious of. We tend to fall into this category uh, quite often, speaking uselessly or speaking just whimsically. Uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur in his comment, he says, useless talks, just talking for the sake of, you know, maybe just to be sociable. Arguments, gossip, debates, fault finding in others, speaking lies, blaspheming devotees, these are all detrimental to the practice of devotional service. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, always chanting my glories, Endeavoring with great determination, these great souls bow down before me, and therefore um, they worship me in devotion, like that. 
So uh, we hear from Srila Prabhupada, the tongue has two activities, to vibrate and to taste. Um, we can speak a little bit about these uh, different things. Useless talk, we call it Gramya Kata, and that's uh, Lord Chaitanya instructed uh, uh, Raghunath Das Goswami to never hear the talks of the people in the mundane world, because they always they just speak about the day-to-day -day lives in the world, and sometimes they just speak about whatever they feel like speaking about, because the pushing of the tongue is so strong that one wants to speak, and sometimes it doesn't matter what comes out as long as I'm speaking. It's grumyakata. Um, Sarva Bhoma Bhattacharya. He makes a nice statement just after he became purified in the association of Lord Chaitanya. And he was very expert at scrutinizingly studying scriptures and speaking and giving various types of conclusions. But most of those conclusions were useless arguments, which led ultimately to, to Mayavad philosophy or, you know, away from devotional service. So he says, in the association of jackals known as logicians, I, simp I simply continued to bark a resounding bye bye. Now from the same mouth, I am chanting the holy names of Krishna and Hari, like that. So useless talks. Talking without reason, um, uh, debates, uh, we find that, you know, devotees don't get into baits. De devotees will preach Krishna consciousness like that. And uh, sometimes people want to argue. We present that, but to, ha to have a regular debate like that, going back and forth, simply uh, spending time uselessly, uh, trying to better just to chant Hare Krishna. Sometimes we find that, well, we find Lord Chaitanya, how did he deal with Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya? He didn't debate him at all. Although Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was in the mood of debating, what did the Lord do? When Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya wanted to present his philosophy, the Lord just quietly listened. And then after it was all over, he said, uh, you're speaking on Vedanta Sutra, but uh, Vedanta Sutra is like the sun, and your your interpretations are like the clouds that are covering the bright sun. Uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was really shocked, and the Lord then began to explain. He said, actually, you know, it's, and then he gave the explanation of Vedanta Sutra, which is mentioned in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, in Madhya Lila chapter number seven, the whole the Lord explains the difference between personalism and personal, pers impersonalism, and how personalism is superior and the source of impersonalism. Mm -hmm. So, fault finding, of course, that is one of the, not only is it negative speech, it's also very much defensive. Um, there is some allowance for that, but that is done for those who have the, the service to find faults, such, like, such as parents to children, teachers to students, spiritual masters to disciples. Now these ty this type of, it's not fault finding, it's simply observing what is not right, pointing it out, correcting it, and then giving what is the positive side to that. So that is not fault finding. But fault finding uh, arises sometimes due to one's feeling superior to others. This is one of the things that one decides to be the another person's, uh, what we say, corrector or, or someone who is in a position to correct everyone. We find that that's very much in the material world. Everybody's finding fault with everybody else, <laughs> and it goes on. 
as the daily news. And devotional service devotees, uh, uh, speech in the form of blaspheming is the greatest form of inauspicious, like that. Um, mm, Daksha, uh, he blasphemed uh, Lord Shiva. When Prabhupada asked, was asked by Tamal Krishna Goswami, what is the difference between fault finding, blaspheming, and calling a spade a spade? Um, Prabhupada responded, he said, blaspheme simply means um, you have many good qualities, but I look for some fault, and then I broadcast that, and I make that your character description. So he made that in the point that Actually, blaspheme is simply looking for something to defame that person. It's somewhat uh, vengeful and it's, and it's geared in a positive way to uh, destroy a person. Like that. Okay, so uh, lies, of course, we hear from Mother Earth herself. She speaks in the eighth canto. It's mentioned in the eighth canto, Mali Maharaj says that the earth makes the statement where she said, I can bear any type of sinful activity except a liar. So we can understand how detrimental that is just to the whole atmosphere of the world. But it is also a form of uh, also sophistry, half truth, half lies. You know, sometimes uh, we see uh, when one is in a position to try to pre present themselves in a different way, uh, not be able to hide, they present it just like two persons uh, steal something and they're caught. So one man comes up to one of them and says, did you steal it? And the person says, no, I don't have it. And he goes to the other person, do you have it? And the other one person says, no, I didn't steal it. So uh, looking for what we say, half truce, <laughs> in order to somehow vindicate oneself from some wrong activity like that. This is another form of uh, what we say, prajalpa. So um, of course, one should speak the glories of the Lord. Um, one should read the Shastras regularly, become what we say, somewhat versed on what is in the Shastras and find opportunities to share this with others. It creates a proper environment and everyone becomes benefited like that. When satam prasangam mama virya samvido bhavanti rit karna rasayana kata that this um, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord and the association of great souls is actually very much nectar for the heart and for the ears. So one should engage in this type of activity. Um, it's better to not say anything than, than to speak uselessly. Uh, you're never, what we say, what we say, criticized for what you don't say or you're never doing something, what we say, to harm others if you don't speak something. So they say, if you're not sure about what to say, don't say anything. <laughs> uh, worldly talks, this is another form of uh, what we say, uh, prajalpa. What is worldly talks? Well, the things that go on in the world of course, now we find ourselves in a situation where we've been bombarded with a particular you know, situation where finding out what's happening in the world becomes somewhat of an interest for everyone, including the devotees. But how much of that is necessary? So when it goes, goes to the point of becoming absorbed in something that is regular, then it just becomes uh, another form of prajapa, like that. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, there are some worldly talks that are necessary 
for grihastas to maintain, and that is to whatever they need to carry on the affairs of their household life. And he uses terms quite interesting. He says archaeology, zoology, astrology, and geography. Uh, if these are devoid of Krishna consciousness, they should be rejected. But if they're used uh, for devotional service, they can they don't break the principle of Prajapa. I mean they don't they are in in line with proper speech. Like now, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he also says something interesting, and this interesting statement is also in reference to a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. One who indulges in praising and criticizing the qualities and behavior of others will quickly become deviated from his own best interest and entangled in illusionary dualities. So sometimes it becomes a question. What does it mean we can't, if we criticize, or if we, we praise another? We can understand to criticize another should be very much avoided, strongly avoided. But praising, praising another, well, the point here is made, and it's the previous verse, which is not mentioned here, but one cannot see the whole picture. So criticism and praise is always uh, what we say incomplete and sometimes even uh, inaccurate. So therefore one should avoid that. But then it goes on to say there's a sub-injunction that's mentioned that one can praise others but that has to be done in the right way. What is that praise? A form of encouragement that one can offer according to how one is experiencing something, that encouragement comes by if a devotee does something wonderful, uh, we, we say thank you very much, that was a wonderful preparation you cooked, all the devotees really enjoyed it, that was a wonderful uh, a class, uh, we got so much out of it. That encouragement is, is, is not against the prin principles of this verse because it can be used as a way to inspire the devotee to continue in his devotional service, and the devotee will take it that way. But when it becomes too much, just like sometimes they say that uh, uh, flattery, now flattery is a little bit like just trying to praise someone in order to be known as a, as a, pray, as a, as a nice guy. We find that there are people who engage in such things. They want to always say something nice about everyone. Why? Because they want to be known as a nice person like that. And, but that's pretentious. And it's actually somewhat contrary to, to uh, uh, proper relationship because that's another form of criticism. Too much praise is an, actually a form of criticism. That's mentioned in the, in the Bhagavatam also. So one should be very, what we say, uh, careful what to speak, how to speak, and when to speak like that. I was just thinking of one statement I happened to come across. Um, it was, an, it was a Chinese saying. I read it in uh, one temple that was posted on one door. And they had posted this statement. It says, it is a weakness to speak when one should be quiet. It is a weakness to, be, to remain silent when one, sh sh is, one is required to speak. So I think that can also help us to understand and use that discriminating factor. And if you're not sure, either way, it's always better to err on the side of uh, not speaking. Okay, so the next one is Niyamagraha, too much attachment to or too much neglect of rules and regulations. So, there are rules, there are regulations like that. 
There are things to do, there are things to avoid, like that. Uh, one should understand one's position in devotional service, and one has to follow the rules and regulations according to one's level of spiritual practice. And that's mentioned in the, uh, by Srila Rupa Goswami, according to one's position. Mm. Here, there's a verse from the 11th canto, Steadiness in one's own position is declared to be actual piety, whereas deviations from one's position is considered to be impiety. In this way, one, the two have to be ascertained. In order to restrict material activities, one has to understand what is, what is, to, what is proper and what is improper amongst all material things, including time, space, and physical objects. So what is beneficial and what is not beneficial? What can be used in Krishna service? What should be re rejected? What do I need? Um, in other words, one has to follow general principles, but as one makes advancement in devotional service, the principles may change according to that advancement. And here, one verse says, as long as one is not satiated by food of activities, and one has not awakened their taste of devotional service, then one has to act according to regular principles of the Vedic injunctions. Uh, so we find the thing, things to do and things to avoid. <clears throat> Sanatana Goswami has given that as what, two of the principles of the of the. Uh, of the method of surrender. It's called anukulena and pratikul, uh, things that are favorable and things that are unfavorable in devotional service. If one rejects things just out of whim or accepts things out of whim, then um, that uh, can deviate one from one's devotional service. So one has to know uh, what is favorable and what is uh, unfavorable, like, unlike that. Uh, Rupa Goswami mentions in this relationship to the nine stages of bhakti. Uh, of course, one who is, you know, fixed in devotional service, it may be uh, the rules and regulations are not the same for one who is not fixed in devotional service. Hmm. So one has to follow one's prescribed duty according to, like that. When a diseased eyes is treated by a medical ointment, it gradually recovers the power. Similarly, a conscious living entity cleanses himself from material contaminations. In Krishna speaking this verse by hearing and chanting the narrations of my glories. So, um, what is favorable, what is unfavorable? One has to follow rules and regulations according to one's level of practice and devotional service. Rules and regulations for renunciates and rules and regulations for the Grihasta ashram are obviously different in many cases, like that. Um, so one has to understand what are those principles. And that becomes somewhat evident in uh, the things to do, and we'll speak about that tomorrow. It's called Sadhu Vritti. What are the rules for Grihastas? What are the rules? for those in the other ashrams like that. The one, one has to act according to one's prescribed duty. One gets one's prescribed duties according to one's position. Of course, if one is not involved directly in devotional service, but is practicing the level of the Van Ashram, there's rules and regulations for Van Ashram like that. So these, uh, Nectar of Devotion has the 64 rules and regulations that one should follow. There's some do's, there's some don'ts. Um, if we somehow or other think this is important and that one is, is not an important 
then some then we actually deviate from our own best interests if we're not sure what is important just like certain things apply to india and certain rules and regulations don't apply to the western just like it says that you know uh, one should um, uh, let's see what is it uh, i'm trying to think of that one that applies to india I think it is, you know, uh, it has to do with the de uh, carrying the deity on the palaquin. Uh, and there's certain uh, ritualistic ceremonies that are required. And the deity has to be carried on a palaquin. In other cases, it's not necessary. Okay. So these are some of the. Uh, and then the nine stages of bhakti, Adaustrata, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, Anartha Nivritti, Nishta Ruchi, Ashakti, uh, Bhava, and Prema. So according to one, uh, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, as one leaves behind one level, one has to follow the rules and regulations of another level. If one doesn't, if one stays on one level, and doesn't move to the next level of one's devotional service, then one fails to make advancement and can also fall down in devotional service. So what is the general rule? Here's the general rule that makes everything easy. And this is a verse from the, uh, I think it's from the Padma Purana. And that is, um, let me find this particular verse, it's interesting. Um, okay, where is that verse? Uh, yeah, in other words, there are two injunctions which make up the process of all activities. If one follows these two injunctions, they're following all the injunctions. And that is one should always remember Krishna and one should never forget Krishna. All the rules and regulations become subservient to one always remembering Krishna and, always, and never forgetting Krishna. And that is in the favorable way, not in the Kamsa way. He was always remembering Krishna, but he was doing it in, because he was fearful of being killed by Krishna. Therefore, he, he didn't gain devotional service. Although he got purified by remembering Krishna, he didn't attain to the platform of devotional service. So if one is following that, then all the rules and regulations become subordinate to that. Okay. Um, the next one is Janasanga associated with worldly minded persons. Um, uh, those who are not interested in devotional service, what does association mean? Association means to develop affection for. Um, one can have what we say uh, uh, official association, just like we go out, you go shopping, or you have some business in the, in the secular world. You're with other people who are materialists. And you carry on your business, you're friendly, and, you know, that's not that's not breaking Janu Sangha. That's not associating with morally minded people. Association means when you enter into a relationship and you share your more or less thoughts and feelings about things, and then you start to give up your values and easily become affected by what is being given. So one should be very careful of that. Um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur mentions seven categories. He says these seven types of people should be avoided. Mayavadis and atheists, gross sense enjoyers, those who are fond of sense enjoyers, uh, uh, improper relationships with the opposite sex, those who are attached to the opposite sex, they're also, you know, like that. They also become undesirable. 
the hypocritically devout, those who actually can claim to be great devotees or engage in devotional service, but there it's, it's just a show, and the ill-behaved, foolish outcasts. So he names these seven like that. Uh, Raghunath Das Goswami explains one of the ways that one should carefully avoid association with non-devotees, and that is to accept foodstuffs cooked by non-devotees. It says that when one eats food cooked by a materialistic person, one minds become contaminated. And then one's mind, being in that stage, is unable to think of Krishna properly like that. Uh, if one has to associate with um, the opposite sex, one should do it only to carry on business and not in a in a a way that is going beyond the, what is necessary. But generally, we find for householders that that is given some license, of course, not in a broad sense, but with one's, one's wife and well, maybe with one's uh, relatives like that and friends. But for the renunciates, there is no allowance for that. And uh, as Prabhupada said, you know, one should avoid the association, not Prabhupada, I'm sorry, the uh, Bhagavatam said, one should avoid the association of women. And then the, it goes on to explain that for a man, woman is woman, and for a woman, man is woman. So the word woman refers to the opposite sex in, in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So when it says, of, Avoiding association with women, it means undesirable or unnecessary association with the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The hypocritically devout, these are the most dangerous. Uh, it says better to associate with sense enjoyers than the hypocritically devout. Some of them become gurus. Uh, they they gather disciples, they accumulate wealth, followers, ladies, material assets, and they present themselves. They Sometimes they can even quote Shastras very nicely. They speak very nicely. Uh, they're online with, on YouTube, All of, a lot of them are there. <laughs> you can somehow or other, you know, come across them everywhere. Um, they want to be known as being a devo de devotional, but they are just presenting. It sometimes it's hard to see that, but when you uh, when you start to uh, uh, observe their activities, then you can understand more. It says better to and associate with sense enjoyers than the hypocritically devout. Sense enjoyers are in two categories. One is um, those who make uh, Krishna the source of their sense enjoyment, and those who uh, uh, include Krishna as one of their forms of sense enjoyment. Um, in other words, um, no, actually, this is that refers to a different category. I'm sorry. The, uh, for those uh, sense enjoyers, if someone makes Krishna their form of sense enjoyment, that is not as bad as those who simply engage in sense enjoyment. Because there are people who want to enjoy devotional service. They know devotional service and is enjoyable. So they make Krishna and the spiritual master their object of enjoyment. Now we should avoid that association also. Here's an example of one who is somewhat a Mayavadi, but it's hard to, like Mayavadis are very, very hard to detect a lot of times. They speak very devotionally. They even chant the holy names of the Lord. We have the example in the Shastra 
Ram, Ramadas Vishwasu was a very wonderful, he was a friend of uh, Gopal Bhatta Goswami. When he met Gopal Bhatta Goswami, he was very much impressed by this great Vaishnava and he wanted to do service for Gopal Bhatta Goswami. Gopal Bhatta Goswami was on his way to Jagannath Puri to see Lord Chaitanya. And so Ramadas Vishwasu asked if he could come along and carry his bags and do service for him. Because he was such a nice person and because he was also chanting the names of Ram continuously, he would constantly chant the name of Ram. Gopal Bhatta Goswami accepted his association. Finally, when they arrived in Jagannath Puri, they were met by Lord Chaitanya. They were greeted nicely, but not Ramadas Vishwasu. The Lord spoke only to uh, Gopal Bhatta Goswami and didn't even look at uh, Ramadas, Ramadas Vishwasu. Ramadas Vishwasu couldn't understand why the Lord didn't pay any attention to him at all. He acted like he wasn't even there. So then it was understood that the Lord explained that give this uh, idea up that you want to become Lord Ramachandra. Serve Ramachandra. You cannot become Ramachandra. So his, his motivation for chanting the lames of the Lord was to become the Lord or become like the Lord. So this, these, are, these are different types of uh, Janasanga. So one can overcome this by associating with the devotees. Sarusanga, Sarusanga, Sarvasastri Hoi, Lavamatta, Sarusange, Sarvasiddhi Hoi. We have to have association. Association is actually a principle of human existence. <laughs> Those who don't want association are not happy. <laughs> Association is just natural, but it's uh, we want association that is inspiring or what we say educating, edifying, uplifting. Um, therefore, we have to associate with devotees, and in the association of devotees, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord or assisting each other in devotional service is the uh, principle of that association. Just like we find here now in this present situation, our association has become somewhat limited. And sometimes, I know personally, I feel like I would like to have more association with devotees and I'm missing, missing the association of certain devotees. So it's actually natural like that. But not that because we, because one doesn't have what we say the available of devotee association, they look for association in the other, in the other category. So it says here there's a verse from uh, from Bhakti Rasama to Sindhu. It's actually mentioned in Mud in Madhya Lila. It says it's better to accept the miseries of being encaged within bars and surrounded by burning flames than to associate with those bereft of Krishna consciousness. Such association is a very great hardship. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because that association can cause you to lose your inspiration in devotional service and even in some cases give it up. It says this is the process a fall down that one starts to associate with non-devotees, starts to pick up some of their characteristics and tendencies, and then starts to find fault with devotees, thinking that the non-devotees are actually better because they, you know, for whatever reason, maybe uh, that's their experience. Okay, so the la last one is laoyam. Laoyam means ardent longing and greed. I hope I'm not taking up too much time with these different things here. We'll save time. And this is this is uh, greed for material things. 
In other words, one has to control the mind and senses, get free from attachment and aversion. Attachment and aversion are, are the same, size, same, same thing, except uh, defined in a different way. Aversion is another form of attachment. One has to rise above aversion and attachment because these are stumbling blocks. They're obstacles in the path of devotional service. One has to become attached to Krishna, and then automatically one develops natural aversion for everything that is against the process of devotional service. Mm -hmm. So therefore it says, those who are on this path are resolute in purpose, their aim is one. So one's mind has to develop that resolute to become fixed in devotional service to learning how to control the mind and senses, not be allured by sense objects. The mind has a tendency to gravitate towards sense objects. If the, sen if the intelligence is of the same nature as the mind, then it's the intelligence is going to assist the mind in bringing, in bringing one in contact with sense gratification. So therefore, the intelligence has to be purified by hearing from Shastra and by understanding Shastra and making Shastra's principle the foundation for the execution of devotional service. When the intelligence is purified, the mind can be restricted from unnecessary sense gratification. And then, even if one is in association with sense objects, one becomes, what we say, unaffected. They become indifferent to that association. Although, it's right there. Yeah, uh, one who is fixed on Krishna consciousness or thinking about Krishna, then uh, even the, the sense objects, although present, uh, become weak and actually have no, what we say, effect upon the devotee like that. So this uh, laoyam is uh, greedy for sense gratification. It's characterized by restlessness of the mind and intelligence. One has to apply the principles of what is favorable and what is unfavorable. One has to know that. And these are mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion, what is favorable and what is unfavorable. Uh, by spiritualizing the senses, by engaging the senses in devotional service, then one becomes, what we say, attuned to accepting what is favorable. Even when one is engaged in devotional service, as we mentioned in the other categories, well, one may also desire position, uh, some material happiness, material comfort, even liberation, simply by the execution of one's devotional service. This is this is another meaning of greed. Greed comes under two desire things. Greed for material desires, material enjoyment, either heavenly or worldly, or greed for, uh, what we say, liberation. In other words, revelation means I execute my devotional service in order to get free from material suffering. But the devotee is not interested in, in mitigating the material suffering. What they're interested in is they're, they're interested in, in developing love for Krishna. So as one's attachment to Krishna comes, then their, their desires for material ta attachments automatically wane naturally, just as when the sun comes out, all the darkness leaves. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur ends this particular summary in this area, and he says, when one is favored by Krishna, in, de in devotional service, one is pleasing Krishna, then everything material automatically will become available for the devotee that is necessary for them to practice Krishna consciousness and to live nicely. One doesn't have to separately endeavor for these things. So this greed, greed for material things, greed for more and more so a lot of these uh, six things are overlapping. You'll see prayasa and laoyam somewhat overlap oh, like that, uh, like that. And uh, talking unnecessarily and associating with 
the wrong type of people, we find that those, a lot of these principles overcome. So learn these particular six objects. Uh, get an understanding of how to avoid these six things. And then, uh, uh, as we say, when you practice the positive, then the negative automatically goes. But due to our association with the material energy and the responsibilities we have in our service, we have a tendency to come in contact with these uh, opportunities to become deviated in devotional service, to speak nonsense, to associate with the wrong type of people in the wrong way, uh, to, uh, to what we say, uh, commit offenses uh, like that. So. Um, therefore, just be conscious of the different traps that one can easily fall in. And again, the solution is to always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. And to practice that means to practice very seriously our sadhana from day to day. We want to get that visayan vini vartantenya hirasya dehinam rasobhyasyam prasopyasya param Drisva, param drisva, we want that higher taste. The higher taste comes from the activities of devotional service. In the meantime, until we have that higher taste, we have to strictly follow the rules and regulations, especially avoiding certain types of association and certain types of activities and certain mentalities that lead to these activities. Okay, so um, that's about my time. I was supposed to stop at 1.15. So, uh, yeah. So I'll stop here. Uh, there's a lot more we can say in relationship to each one of these things, but that's pretty much the essence as given to us by uh, Rupa Goswami and uh, Bhakti Vinod Dakar. So uh, we'll open it up for discussion. If anyone would like to either comment, any of the senior devotees out there, they can also offer any comments if they'd like to add something from their own experiences, realizations. Hare Krishna, Maharaj, thank you. We have had, um, thank you for ex emphasizing the power of staying quiet and also teaching us how to praise devotees. We have numerous questions online that have come through. Would you like us to start the questions? Uh, yeah, take them. Yeah. If there's any devotees, you know, any devotees who are senior there, they should be given first priority if they want to speak something. Okay, we have Buddha Bhavana Prabhu online, Sudananda Prabhu. So if you'd like to come online. Or anyone else. <laughs> I think we're just unmute, unmuting the Maharaj. Okay, uh, we'll take any questions that are available. Okay, we can start with the questions and maybe they can join. When they're ready to join, we can have them join, the senior devotees. Okay. okay. Okay, so we have numerous questions on, uh, on, on basically praise. So the question is, Maharaj, is from Radha Vinodini, but there's few devotees asking the same question. It's, can you please speak a little more on the topic of too much praise in the form of criticism? What does that actually mean? Okay. We also got a, a message on the chat. Uh, Sundar Nandar said he can't unmute himself. So can you help him with that? Yes, of course, Maharaj. Okay. 
Yeah, it's mentioned that, you know, uh, it's, an, it's another form of insult. That's what the Bhagavatam says, that uh, to, you know, to, to be praising uh, is another form of insult because... Um, It deviates one's intelligence away from their actual real business is to engage in devotional service. It's nice, and it's also Vaishnava's culture to offer some encouragement. But generally, when it's done in excess, then there is a motivation behind that. Sometimes we see that, that even people do that in order so the people that they praise will feel happy and want to do something for them. So there's some kind of like desire for reciprocation. For... Arivao Sundananda. Aisha, mm -hmm. my beautiful uh, uh, presentation, Maharaj. It's, you take us into such a depth of uh, of all these points that uh, you. Well, I'm, I've been reflecting on what you've been saying. I just wanted to um, make two, one, one question, one comment. Um, I was reflecting on the association, and uh, I was thinking that um, very often we have a garb, we wear a garb of of associating with devotees. But when we associate with devotees, as you, as you so beautifully said, what does the association actually mean? It doesn't simply mean, uh, uh, you know, being in physical proximity with the devotees or, or else just having a conversation with a devotee. Unless we actually are discussing Krishna, as you rightly said, never forget Krishna or always remember Krishna, then it almost becomes an offense to consider us in being in association of devotees when we are just discussing either Gram Katha or, or, or else just having socializing or, or just discussing and gossiping even with devotees. So I feel that often devotees lack this point that yes, we are not associating with outside people, we are not associating with non-devotees, we are associating with devotees, but that association is taken so lightly that it's just, um, it almost becomes an offense to the fact that we are having an association. That was my first point. And the second point, very, you, very interesting point you made, and I hadn't uh, heard that before. I just wanted to sort of ask your uh, reference and, uh, on that and, and, this, uh, and, the, uh, and a bit more explanation. You mentioned, uh, you know, about women, and you said women uh, for man is woman, and for woman, woman is a man. This is like referring to the opposite sex. I thought that was a very, very powerful statement. I hadn't heard that before. No, that's, that's, in, that's in the Bhagavatam. And it's also mentioned in one lecture by Prabhupada. And I also heard Radhanath Swami speak that a few times. So, um, yeah, it's that because the Bhagavatam only says, you know, one should not associate with women. But then again, it means opposite sex because, you know, there's two, there's two genders. So the word women refers to the opposite sex. That is the actual meaning in the Bhagavatam. Thank you, Anish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That needs clarification. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What else do we have? Mm -hmm. Okay. Buddha Bhavana Prabhu said he will ask later, Maharaj. <laughs> so we'll go on to the next question, if that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're here until until one o'clock or two two o'clock, I mean. We're two, here until two. two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Mataji called Gail is asking. Also, is it permissible for grahastas to talk about zoology or archaeology, etc.? 
Well, that's mentioned in that text by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He uses that as an example for uh, carrying on one's household affairs. So if it's not a necessary subject to carry on household affairs, then no matter what it is, it falls into the category of Prajalpa. Bhakti Vinod Thakur just picks some things that the householders might be needing to uh, discuss in order to maintain the household. So that's still, those are for instances, like when you give a, you give a statement, you give a for instance. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. So just to become interested in zoology <laughs> for the sake of interest, is not required if it has something to do with your maintaining your you know the animals you're taking care of then then that's so uh, that's important okay i hope that answers your question gail mataji can we take the next question Maraj? Yeah, if anybody is unsure of my answer, they can respond back, of course. Okay. Is that all right, Gail? <laughs> or do we need more on that one? We'll get her answer on the chat, Maharaj, and we'll come back if she needs cl further clarification. Okay. Okay. So the next question is, why is it wrong to have affection for non-devotees? How else can we preach? I think this is quite a common question amongst devotees. Mm -hmm. Affection means to enter into their relationship and then you start sharing values, you start sharing your experiences together. And then their values are not, are not you know, they'll talk about things of their own personal life. And it's better, Prabhupada says, when you're giving your associate, when you're associating with others, you have to give them your association and not take their association. So what does that mean? You become the association. So if you're, if you're preaching, you have to bring people into that arena where the topic becomes related to Krishna consciousness or like that. Yeah, something to preaching, something in Krishna consciousness. If you use some preliminary opening statements like some friendly talks just to, uh, just to bring about a relationship, that you can do. But when you start sharing like, what did they, you know, they talk, talking about what, what they did on the weekend, what is their uh, interest in life, then um, you're entering into an area where your value system is going to be challenged. You might even think, oh no, I don't agree with all that. But now you started developing a relationship. So and then, so therefore one has to be careful not to just keep things official. You can keep it friendly, but not, don't develop that, uh, that intimate relationship. That intimate relationship is needed for every human being. We have to have intimate relationships with others, and that, that should be done within the circle of devotees. Keep it in with the devotees, and you can find the happiness of intimacy in your relationship with other devotees. You don't have to go outside to fulfill that need. Okay, Maraj. The next question is from Amanda. She's asking, how does one stop fault finding others within the mind? They may not say such judgments out loud, but they are still saying such things to themselves. Well, it says that if you commit negativity in the mind, it doesn't have a reaction. But if you keep it in the mind, it'll grow. 
and it also deviates your consciousness away from the proper the proper things you should be thinking of. So um, the idea is just to replace it or to dismiss it. Most of the time, when you find faults with others in the mind, when it might come in. And then you can start thinking of the good qualities of that same person. So that, that's the antidote, that when we find, start thinking of the faults, start thinking of the good qualities. If you start speaking the faults, then you're gonna find yourself getting a, a reaction for that, and then it'll, it'll impair on your devotional service. So Lord Chaitanya gives the formula. He says, I give my full mercy to anyone who develops an attachment to chant the holy names of Krishna and doesn't find fault with others. So it starts in the mind. So when it starts in the mind, here's where you have to stop it on that, on that point. Once it, it starts, if it stays in the mind, it will start to develop strength. And then it, might, it may come out. And if it does come out, then that's where the offense is committed. So, like I mentioned, unless one is in a position to correct others, such as parents, teachers, you know, police officers, <laughs> uh, you know, people in authority who have a duty to make sure the people that they are protecting are also uh, you know, not acting wrongly, then they, they can also point out a fault for the sake of uh, benefiting that person. But generally, you know, all this other fault finding is just, just the restlessness of the mind. Usually when we find faults with others, the same fault exists within us and we project it outwardly. Mm -hmm. As Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, when the faults of others cause disturbance to you, look within yourself and see what is the cause of that disturbance. Amanda Mataji, I hope that answers your question. Please let us know if you need further clarification online. Maharaj, we have Vishaka Mataji, temple president online. So we can connect Mataji now, if you would like. Yeah. First, thank you, Amanda from, from, uh, by, what is it? Uh, where is that place? I forgot the name of the place. Okay, my obeisances to Amanda and to Mother Vishaka, my humble obeisances. I'm mm -hmm. feeling honored to have your association. I'm very honored to be able to hear you. Thank you so much for your enlightening talks. Thank you for being you. <laughs> I'm trying to improve. <laughs> Thank you. Is anything I you would like to say to the devotees? Well, it's a difficult time, and I think that we're using this technology in the, the best possible way. Otherwise, the technology will be completely useless. So Krishna has provided it, so we're Krishnaizing it. And I really appreciate your your contributions to this process. Thank you. It's happening all over the world. Devotees are taking advantage. And uh, we're keeping in association with each other so we can uh, stay inspired in our practice. Yeah. Thank you. That's important. Perhaps Thank there are other questions. I, I really enjoy the question and answer part of the discourse. Mm -hmm. Good. It'll go on for a while, and then we'll have His Grace Bhutabhavana speaking uh, 
two hours after I end. So we'll have more today. Um, I look forward to getting your association when, when we can uh, start to stretch our legs beyond the borders here. Thank you, Vishakha Mataji. Our humble obeisances to you and all glories to Sri Prabhupada. My humble obeisances to you as well. The devotees at the manor are missing Maharaja's ecstatic kirtans. <laughs> and the dog. And... Sorry. I'm also missing kirtan too. <laughs> 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 and the devotees at the manor. <laughs> and the dancing. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sure we'll be together soon, Maharaj and Vishaka Mataji. Yeah, Krishna's got a plan. For the devotees, everything's auspicious. We can carry on with the next question, Maharaj? Of course. Okay. So we have a question from Kishan. He's asking, in terms of association with non-devotees, can Marj expand on what that looks like? How do we know we're associating and spending time with the wrong person? When, you, when you're getting into subjects that are, you know, on the personal level, keep it, keep it official to do business, keep it Krishna consciousness to keep it spiritual. Um, just like if you if you work at a job, you know you have to do your job, so you have to inter interact with people in, in the workplace. You know, make sure the communication is basically to get the job done like that. People in the workplace they want to open up their uh, their uh, personal life to a lot of people. So, that could be dangerous. And you have to somehow or other uh, very respectfully avoid that more intimate association where people want to invite you into their private lives. Uh, if you find yourself in a very awkward position, then um, excuse yourself in a very polite way if you can. Uh, it's something you have to work with. It's something you have to learn. Uh, we interact with so many different types of people and we have to make sure that our value system doesn't get challenged or, or what we say uh, smashed by the wrong association. We live for certain principles and we avoid certain things that are against our principles. And if people start to eulogize these things as a means to become friendly and social, then our consciousness will, will greatly suffer because of that. But, you know, superficial friendliness is okay. You can always say, you know, always, you know keep the friend, keep, be friendly with people, but don't be familiar. That's what it is, being friendly without being familiar. Kishan Prabhu, I hope that is adequate for you. If that, if not, please let us know and we can expand on that and get an answer from Maharaj further. Maharaj, we have one more question. During, okay. se during service, we come across many personalities. What will, our, what will your advice be, Maharaj, if we have a conf conflict with a devotee during service? How should we handle this situation to ensure we have not committed an offence? to the devotee? Well, 
in order to settle conflicts, you know, always take the humble position and listen to what they have to say. If the, everyone is taking the humble position, there's no conflict. If there's some conflict on how to do the service, Prabhupada used to say, uh, you may have a 90% way that is correct, and I might have 80% way that is correct, but if we fight, then the whole thing is lost. Better to accept some kind of agreement and carry on with the service. In other words, uh, uh, I remember Bhakti Vidyata Swami always said, when you, when you have conflicts, always see yourself in the wrong, and then from there try to discuss it. I'm right and you're right, and we both fight, that's all. <laughs> and what, what happens? Who suffers? Prabhupada talks about, you know, how the the father is getting massaged by the two ch children and one is massaging on one side and one is massaging on the other side so the one on one side wants to make the father feel that he's better at massaging so he punches the father on the side of the other si child's massaging and the other side child is punching on the other side so they're causing pain to the father so in the same way, when we fight, then and the devotees don't really are not they're they're non-confrontational. They always try to take the humble position and work it out in a very gentlemanly way. And if that can't if it can't be worked out in a gentlemanly way, then better just to go away. <laughs> But we always have to be, re if we lose respect, that's when everything falls apart. We lose respect for the other person. Thank you, Maharaj. That question was from As Asha Mataji. So I think she'll take, definitely take that on board about respect. <laughs> Asha? Yes, Asha. Where's she from? Mm -hmm. No, our Asha, on the team. Oh, 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 our, our, our Asha. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. So the next question, Maraj, is: Is the desire for validation, encouragement, the same as the desire for fame? It can lead to that. It's a small increment of the same thing. Yeah. Lord Chaitanya gave the formula, uh, amaninam amanadena, to give respect to others and not, at, not look for any respect or reciprocation from others. We just try to serve our best and please the devotees and please Krishna. That's our satisfaction. It's not that we need some validations or some things. If it happens, it's good because then we can use it to uh, further our service. But it's not that we have to, you know, we, we have to have it. And if we don't, we're not inspired or we go down in our service like that. But if one who's looking for it all the time, then that's, that's an increment of that pratishta or desire for fame. We have a couple more questions, Maharaj. So is it okay to carry on till two o'clock? Of course, yeah. Okay. So Tiffany Mataji is asking, in regard to Nia Margara, as a Westerner, sometimes I find myself trying to figure out what the rules are. And also cult what is culturally expect accepted. And what are truly devotional service or spiritual practice? Things like food, what to eat, 
choices of clothes. What would be your guidance of making this clearer for myself so I can give priority of this in my busy life? These guidelines, simplicity. Uh, with regard to every thing, if one is simple, category, it's, you know, whether it's this culture or that culture. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you, Marge. Okay, yeah, I got a message that the internet is a little unstable. Is it still clear? Yes, perfect now, Marge. Okay. So, yeah, the principle is simplicity. Be simple in everything you do. Be straightforward in everything you do. Avoid duplicity. Okay. Like that. Uh, that's a general principle, but how it plays itself out in terms of, you know, what are the rules and regulations? There's we have to learn. Some rules and regulations are fundamental to our success, and, other, and others are uh, they're according to time and circumstance. Like it's just like it says, one should not offer respects to anyone while one is worshiping the deity. So, but then again, there's another injunction that says, but if your spiritual master comes in while you're worshiping the deity, you can stop and offer respects to your spiritual master. But the general principle is when one is worshiping the Lord, no one else should be given respect at that time. <laughs> so you see there's like considerations according to circumstance. <clears throat> okay, anyone else? Yes, there's uh, another question by Gail Mataji again. <laughs> okay. She's asking, is it better to associate with sense enjoyers rather than a hypocritical devotee? Yes, that's what it says. But it's better to avoid both. But out of the two, the hypocrite, hypocrites are worse. They can damage your devotional service. Yeah. So if a devotee is hypocritical, we should uh, try and avoid them in a pleasant well, way. If, if, it, if, it's, if it's something that's continuous, then you know. If, it's, if, it's a, if something is, happens like one time, or, then that's, that's something different. But if a person is pretentious, in other words, they're putting on a show. They, they, what is their motivation? Their motivation is something material, but they use devotional service in order to use, to gain that. Like to be, you know, but devotional service brings about broader intelligence. So some people practice devotional service so they can get more ideas on how to manipulate the material energy for their own sense gratification. Th 
There is also a follow-up question to this, Marge. It's also quite can be quite double-edged. So sometimes we find that we are becoming hypocritical ourselves. How, how don't, can don't, don't become. <laughs> <laughs> you have a choice. Hypocritical means you you have an agenda that's separate from from devotional service. We want to. I'm going to speak a little bit, maybe tomorrow at, at the end of my lecture. We want to develop our love for Krishna. That's the goal of devotional service. If that's your goal, then you're not hypocritical. That is the only goal. This process of devotional service is to awaken our natural love for Krishna. If you pre if you have that in mind, and uh, you're going for that as your goal in devotional service, then you can't be hypocritical. You can't be hypocritical. But if you're thinking, I want to be known as a devotee, um, it's like sometimes uh, we see people. Uh, this is something women may. Maybe women may join the movement and also honor to find a nice husband. Because see, they think if I get a if I get a husband who is a a saintly person, that's a good husband. And then when they get it, they get a saintly husband, but their their goal is the saintly husband and not Krishna. <laughs> You have to you have to question why do I do devotional service? What am I after? Am I, am I trying to love Krishna or am I trying to further my material uh, to success? Okay. We're down to the end. Uh, yeah. I, I believe Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu was going to uh, put the yes topping yeah. on the topping on this whole thing. Okay. We have one lovely question. If if we can finish on that, Maharaj. The question. Okay. okay uh, what is Bhuta Bhavana coming on? <laughs> Bhuta Bhavana will be coming on at. Uh, Later on, 4 p.m. Oh, okay. He says he has nothing to add. Okay. Okay. So we can finish on this question, Maharaj, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's from Dimple Mataji. She's saying, thank you, Maharaj, for this wonderful class. One advice is not to say anything rather than speak uselessly. Many of us can feel silly unable to think of quality questions when we're in the presence of elevated devotees and sannyasis as we put them in on a pedestal. Can you advise how we should manage this feeling when trying to approach such elevated devotees so we can say something intelligent rather than simply staying quiet? Yeah, ask how you can make advancement in devotional service. <laughs> yeah, they're always happy to help you with that. And that's a proper question. Don't try to present yourself as being intelligent in front of senior devotees. It's, you'll be exposed as simply uh, someone who is trying to get attention. Um, yeah, just ask something that will be relevant to your Krishna consciousness. Therefore, if you know you're going to be in association with senior devotees, prepare a question ahead of time that you want to you want to hear the answer from it. Or if you can't do that, and just if you're in the association, look for some opportunity to do some service, some practical service. 
that's another way to associate is look for something some service to do okay we have a time for one more if there is one more thank you marsh for that i think that's quite pertinent to all of us as to how we should speak with elevated personalities like yourself thank you uh if there's we can have one more question if there is yes there's one more okay so it it's a it's from gokul chandra prabhu and he's saying how do we refrain from being defensive to the advice from devotees so if somebody a devotee is giving us some advice how do we listen to that advice or not take it defensively well you might feel mm, some advice is coming in that way and that's that's an immediate feeling but then again listen and see what you can learn from that uh sometimes when something is being said and you can you can see that what they're saying is not actually what we say completely correct but there's something in it that you can gain from it there's something you can gain from it so try to think of what is that you can gain from it or what is krishna doing to you by using this person to speak in this way what does krishna want me to uh, learn what does krishna want me to uh, to get rid of we can always learn from every situation even if it appears to be a little bit awkward thank you maraj for that wonderful session i think it's now two o'clock we can stop here if that's fine with you maraj yeah okay so everybody can take a little break have some lunch um i wish you could all be here in zagreb the weather is is uh, 23 degrees the sun is brightly shining the air is clear and clear and free from all kinds of pollution uh, but unfortunately we'll have to postpone the personal association till next time but thank you all for taking part in this uh, i want to uh, offer my respects and obeisances to everyone and if i said anything that doesn't sound correct or was not in line with uh proper etiquette i apologize for that uh, but i thank you for the opportunity to speak though yes. so devotees our next session will be at uh, 4 p.m uk time which is in two hours time and our guest speaker will be his grace buddha bhavana das so make sure you tune in again if we can finally just unmute our phones and say three hari balls to his holiness chandamoli swami some of it of active in the key jai